Hi everyone, this is Richard. In this video, we are going to go over Project Dueler problem number two, but this time we are going to do it the correct way. If you remember in last video, I said we did it the wrong way. Why is that? Well, if we got the correct answer, you know, both different functions, both different times, so why was it wrong? Well, if you're going to talk about just solving this problem, it wasn't. But what about if we look into the future, we're going to have other Project Euler problems, and it would be nice to reuse some of this code. So what's the problem here? The problem here is we calculate a Fibonacci list, we calculate the Fibonacci numbers, but the only thing we're able to return is the list with the parameter of, the, of knowing what the upper limit of the values themselves are. And here it was 4 million for Project Euler. So that's kind of limiting. Unless we know exactly, unless we're solving this exact problem, this function is rather useless. So the function is limited in the sense that it's not really reusable. It's too, too specific. I would also call this function bloated. People say this a lot. Um, basically, it has different definitions depending on who you talk to. Um, my, my idea of a bloated function is you try to do too much and get not enough out of it at the same time. So in this function, we're trying to do a lot, but what do we get out of it? We get a Fibonacci list who's, where we know what the upper limit, limit is. That's it. We can't tell which number the element is, which value is at a particular line in the list itself. We can't do anything else other than just this, the, the, um, solving the problem. So because it's doing a lot, yet only returning a limited amount, I would call it bloated. Okay, so adding extra code, but in addition to limiting the functionality, not making it better, making it less better in the future. The return object in this one, so what's wrong with this function itself? The return object is questionable, okay? So here, if we had, if you remember this function from last video, here was an optional parameter. If we did not have the optional parameter, we returned a Fibonacci list, again, with the upper limit, same thing as above. If we put a number here, then it would return the actual value right there. You, we either are returning a list or we are returning an integer. And so therefore, we can't statically type what this function actually is that's really frowned upon. We really should not be doing that. It's not that you can't. And for a small list, it's probably not a, a small function. It's probably not a huge deal. But, but that is not a good form and not something that we should be trying to do on a regular basis. What we would probably do is create two different functions. Is that a problem? Well, it's you create two different functions. So as opposed to one, but at the same time, that's the concept of bloated. It's you're, you're trying to do too much and it's making the code a little more complicated. What's the proof that it's more complicated? Well, there's a flaw in this logic as we speak, okay? So if you haven't picked it up already, what if the actual, let's just say this actual, if, if you don't remember, let's close this down. So the actual is the, the um, uh, actually, I don't even remember what the actual actually was. Um, yeah, it was the value, the place of the value right inside of here. I think that was Fibonacci list actual. No, it's the value of the element in the place. Okay, the, so if I if I said 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, if I said um, put under the actual 6, it would return the value 8. Okay, and the upper limit, let's just say, let's call it, okay, say variable, let's just say example equals Fibonacci 4, upper limit is 4 million, right, and actual is 6, print example it would give us eight zero one two three four five six yeah that's correct but the flaw in the logic is what if this number is 600 it'll give us a range error in other words the 600th fibonacci number is beyond four million and therefore it's going to automatically crash the code so, yes, I can always say, okay, I'm going to expand this number much, much higher, but automatically we have a flaw in our logic. Because of the bloatedness, because it was too big, we tried to do too much, 
Therefore, uh, I actually, actually did not see this at first. It, it, well, it didn't take long to figure it out, but I didn't see it at first just because I was trying to do too much into one function itself. So we missed a flaw in I missed a flaw in the logic itself. So that is another problem. So those are the reasons why this is doing the um, solving project dueler the wrong way. We're we're taking, we're getting into bad habits of how to use these functions. What's the solution? What's the right way then? The right way is to start and create little functions that work with each other, that are reusable. Okay, so we will use something, a function that is more reusable, not trying to do too much and therefore taking away, return an actual object and having no flaws in the logic. Just the opposite of, of the problems that we had. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, um, do you remember the problem, um, the, I'm sorry, the function, uh, the function where it said um, Fibonacci int n, sorry, we're down here, it keeps opening up. And then um, if n is less than two, return n, and then return Fibonacci n minus one plus Fibonacci g n minus 2. Do you remember this um, this function? This function um, this function in and of itself is one way to calculate the Fibonacci function but like I said it's kind of slow. But let's make a function similar to this that is that just fun calculates the location if you put in the number that's the number of the Fibonacci in the sequence. So again if I put in number Five, it'll put five. Number six, it'll put, it'll return number eight. Okay, so that's the, we're, I'm just going to create a Fibonacci sequence similar to this, or calculator similar to this, and and this is it right here. So Fibonacci, the position. So whatever position, it'll return the value. List Fibonacci. Position plus one because we're going to return that actual number. So we have to get the um, uh, i in the loop to up to position not less than position right add on to the list and we keep adding on to the list itself and it returns the number um in the fibonacci sequence so if we say example equals fibonacci six it's going to be the value eight right seven is going to be 13 correct it's the next in the sequence, right? So that's what this Fibonacci sequence does. Nice and simple, straightforward, returns very, very quickly. Even if you put 700, that's a big number, I think. Yeah, it's a big number, but it, at least it returns it very, very quickly, okay? Let's just put a smaller number here just to calculate in the future, okay? So, so that's number one. So, okay, but that does one thing. So it's not bloated no flaw in the logic return object is an integer all right so but it doesn't solve our problem correct well what if what else do we want to do what if we want to create a list so we want to return a fibonacci list right here that returns and we could just put in the length so if the length is 20 with the 20th position then we'll return a list of all fibonacci numbers up to 20. So let's create a list of Fibonacci, and we will use this function up here. So the answer is the list. I equals is, is less than this, okay? So it's less than the list, the length of the list. And we do, do a for loop because we know the number of elements that we want in here. We're not and, and we're calculating the values of each one answer.add, so add to the list all the, the numbers in the Fibonacci sequence from 0 up until this number. Actually, so if we're going to 20, it's would, the, the loop would go up to 19, 0 to 19, and then we return the answer. So if it was Fibonacci, what's that called? List? 20, it would give us the Fibonacci sequence in the list right? 
So that's pretty much what I need to do um, to get the basics to solve all of these two problems, these functions right here. So again, simple. It's hard to mess up with the logic. If it is, you fix this small thing, not this big, huge list right here or function right there. And it's, e it's easier to predict. But that's not the, uh, the whole thing. That doesn't solve the problem. So I could solve the problem up here because I just use these two functions, or I could just create a new function, which I, this is bad form, just solve the function up here, okay? Um, so in other words, um, solve the variable um, answer equals, and, and just do the for loop up here to solve the problem. But I, I just wanted to show you, you could create just specifically for this problem, a new function to solve even that. And I'll call it Euler answer two, and basically, the upper limit, so that's going to be the 4 million. This, this function is created solely for this problem and nothing else. So it's not very reusable, right? But it's going to be a small function that's easy to use and easy to create. Um, the sum, and then basically we go to, we add, is it each Fibonacci is even? Then we basically add it together in the Fibonacci list. It goes through the Fibonacci list. If it's even... Add it onto the Fibonacci list if it's not, and if the Fibonacci value goes up to the upper limit, which is 4 million, it'll break and return the sum. Okay, so this is a continuation of the last video. So basically, answer equals Euler answer 4 million. And I think that's the correct answer right there. So that's why doing it this way, or of course, you could always just do this. Um, you can always just do, I think this will work. Um, you could do that as well if Fibonacci A for int i equals upper limit. So this would be 4 million. And this would be 4 million. And we could print that. That would give us the same answer itself. Okay, but, but that's not using it as a function. That's probably the best way to actually solve this, this problem. Two functions that create a list, or even just this one function right, right by itself, right here. And then creating this answer to the problem itself, okay? So if we're going to um, sum up, though, let's take a look at this. This we can get if we need to calculate the Fibonacci list or the Fibonacci sequence and the value in the position of, of a particular position. We can just reuse this code for every other problem where you need to use it in Project Euler, right? Now... Um, if we need to calculate the list, we can reuse this list. So this would actually be called a library. All right. So a library is basically a piece of code that you would actually use and you can reuse in different times. It's something where you can have, it's when you use a function or method to do something which is well established. This is another library. So if you want, you could put these two together. So this is another library where you return a Fibonacci list or a sequence with the known length. However, this depends up this depends upon this. So this library depends upon this library. So that becomes a dependency. So we're using a lot of terms here, okay? So there is a, a library dependency. So you can see, you could possibly see that if you don't include all dependencies, if you just use this library, copied and pasted it, and you forgot this one, it's not going to work. And you're going to kind of wonder what's going on, but the Dart editor will help you out. Libraries themselves, you'll hear these terms thrown around. There's also something called an API, which is called, stands for Application Programming Interface. We're far away from actually creating these ourselves, so please be patient. And uh, then toolkit. You'll hear these terms. Basically, all of these terms refer to libraries. The implication, the, the 
when you use the term API is typically um, when it's referring to an established program. So this is not really an established program, right? This is just a piece of code. You copy and paste it. That's just a, a non-specific generic library. When you have a set program like the Linux kernel, you, you have functions or methods within the Linux kernel, which you can call like a function, like right here, um, that does certain things, like it turns on the hard drive or something like that. So these are APIs. They're called APIs because they're part of a bigger established program, like a, an operating system kernel. Toolkit is basically a series. It's kind of a vague term. I, I don't have exact de definition of that, but basically a series, of, an accumulation of libraries that allow you to do something. So if you have a toolkit, you have a bunch of these libraries, which may depend upon other libraries, and, and, and they form a toolkit. So if I had a big a Fibonacci sequence and a bunch of other things, I could call it the Fibonacci toolkit. Okay, so it's just a term where um, it, it just refers to you have a bunch of different libraries or APIs that you can actually use. All right, so I hope this was helpful. And this was functional programming. Next, we're going to move on to classes. And classes are a different way of organizing your code. From now on, though, as long as you use functions, you really can use, can solve any problem in Project Euler, at least from what I recall. I don't know. I haven't solved all, solved all of the problems. But um, it, you should be able to solve almost all of these and do most of the moderately complex programs from at least what we know. Again, we still got a long way. When you have a very, very, very complex program, you're going to want to use classes, and that's what we're going to go over next. Okay? So thank you for watching.